Tonight, sailing support. Gaza set to receive aid by sea as ships leave Cyprus, stock full of essentials as the conflict continues to worsen the humanitarian crisis in the region. Citizenship crisis. Sporadic protests bring chaos to India as Modi's new citizenship law is decried by Muslims nationwide. It's on. Trump and Biden are set to face off in a rematch of the 2020 elections, despite mounting concerns of lack of faith of Americans on either side. And gentle giants. Thailand celebrates their beloved elephants with a national day to commemorate the creature's significance in their culture. All that and more as World News Tonight starts right now. This is Ava Verna World News Tonight. Reporting from Colombo, here's Anuradhi Vikramasinghe. Hello and welcome to World News Tonight. Thank you very much for tuning in as always this Wednesday night. We've got lots to cover on updates to the key stories that we have been following so far. So let's dive right in, starting off with the Israel-Palestine conflict. A ship transporting almost 200 tons of food to Gaza left a port in Cyprus in a pilot project to open a new sea route for aid to a population on the brink of famine in Gaza. Gaza has been sealed off from the outside world since Israel began its air and ground invasion five months ago, and the United Nations has warned of widespread starvation. The charity ship Open Arms sailed out of the port of Larnaca, towing a barge containing flour, rice and protein. The 200-mile journey to Gaza could take as long as two days because of the heavy tow barge. Bureaucratic obstacles and insecurity have hampered aid deliveries since the start of the war on October 7th. Aid agencies say the latest resort to sea routes and airdrops can provide only limited relief, since Israel has sealed off most land crossings. That was also the mood among sceptical Gazans on the beach at Rafah, near the southern border with Egypt. Hussein Atallah, displaced like most people in the enclave, said aid should be able to cross by land. Also, the border between us and Egypt is 15 kilometers long. So why the port then? This is the question. Why would they do a port here? The aid ship was funded mostly by the UAE and organized by US-based charity World Central Kitchen. With much of Gaza reduced to rubble, WCK said it was building a landing jetty with material from destroyed buildings. Qatar's foreign ministry spokesperson, Majid al-Ansari, said on Tuesday negotiators seeking a ceasefire between Israel and Hamas were not close to a deal. There'd been hopes for a truce in time for Ramadan, which began this week. More than 31,000 Palestinians have been killed since Israel launched its war on October 7th. Following an attack by Hamas militants that killed 1,200 people in southern Israel and took 253 hostages, according to Israeli tallies. And over into the Russia-Ukraine conflict now, hopes on fighting back have been renewed afresh as the U.S. will now deliver a new military aid package for Ukraine worth $300 million as the White House scrambles to find ways to send more assistance given the situation on the battlefield and the resistance to the funding from Republican hardliners. On behalf of President Biden, I'm announcing an emergency package of security assistance of $300 million worth of weapons and equipment to address some of Ukraine's pressing needs. The White House on Tuesday said the U.S. would deliver a new military aid package for Ukraine, the first such move in months, as additional funds for the country remain blocked by Republicans in Congress. U.S. National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan said the new funding would come from unanticipated cost savings from Pentagon contracts. Those contracts came in under budget, so we have a modest amount of funding available. This emergency package that we're announcing contains a large tranche of artillery rounds and Gimlers for the HIMARS. It is assistance that Ukraine desperately needs to hold the line against Russian attacks and uh, to push back against the continuing Russian onslaught in the east and in other parts of Ukraine. The White House has been scrambling to find ways to send more military assistance given the situation on the battlefield and resistance to the funding from Republican hardliners. This ammunition will keep Ukraine's guns firing for a period, but only a short period. The $300 million in new assistance is only a fraction of the $60 billion in security aid for Ukraine that was passed last month by the Senate 
but has been stalled in the House of Representatives by Republican Speaker Mike Johnson. The House Speaker and ally of former President Donald Trump has so far refused to call a vote on the bill. Our friends in Ukraine are running out of ammo. The Senate's Republican leader, Mitch McConnell, on Tuesday urged Johnson to hold a vote on the assistance package, which would also provide aid to Israel and Taiwan. I want to encourage the Speaker again to allow a vote, a vote, let the House speak on the supplemental that we sent over to them several weeks ago. Tuesday's announcement comes as Poland's president and prime minister met with President Joe Biden at the White House to talk about other ways to bolster support for Ukraine, as his administration waits for the supplemental funding to be passed in the House. And over in neighboring India now, sporadic protests have erupted against a citizenship law that has been criticized for discriminating against Muslims after Prime Minister Narendra Modi's government implemented the legislation just days before a general election is announced. Protests broke out in the eastern state of Assam and the southern state of Tamil Nadu late on Monday, right after the law was put into effect, according to authorities. There had been no reports of damage or clashes with security forces as of early Tuesday. Modi's Hindu nationalist BJP government framed rules on Monday to implement the Citizenship Amendment Act, making it easy for non-Muslim refugees from three Muslim-majority South Asian nations to get Indian citizenship. The enactment of the law in 2019 led to huge protests and sectarian violence where many were killed, forcing the government to delay its implementation. In Assam, protesters burnt copies of the law and local opposition parties have called for a statewide strike on Tuesday. There, many fear it could increase migration from neighboring Muslim Bangladesh, a long-standing flashpoint that has polarized the state for decades. Others, including Hindu refugee from Pakistan, Mira, support the move. Rights activists and Muslim groups say the law, combined with the proposed National Register of Citizens, can discriminate against India's 200 million Muslims, the world's third largest Muslim population. Modi's government denies it is anti-Muslim and says the law is needed to help minorities facing persecution in Muslim-majority nations. It says the law is meant to grant citizenship, not take it away, and says the protests are politically motivated. And on to the road to the White House tonight, we are all set to see a rematch of the 2020 contenders. As Donald Trump has clinched the Republican nomination for president, setting up a rematch with Joe Biden, the incumbent president who secured the Democratic nomination just last night. For more on this, we have other than a world news special correspondent, Suzanne Shanali from Toronto in Canada. What's the latest, Suzanne? Anurad, the primary results mean U.S. voters face a rematch of the 2020 presidential election in eight months' time. The nominations will be made official at party conventions this summer. The 81-year-old president said that he was honored. Voters had backed his re-election bid in a moment when the threat Trump poses is greater than ever. Despite persistent concerns over voters that his age limits his ability to perform the duties of presidency, the party apparatus rallied around him. Meanwhile, Trump remains very popular with the Republican voter base, which has propelled him to victory in primary after primary over well-funded rivals. His campaign for a second term in the White House has zeroed in on strict immigration laws, including a pledge to seal the border and implement record-setting deportations. Trump has also vowed to fight crime, boost domestic energy production, tax foreign imports, end the war in Ukraine and resume an America first approach to global affairs. Last night's results do not come as a shock as both men have dominated their races so far. Both their renominations seem all about predetermined, despite polling that indicates Americans are dissatisfied with the prospect of another showdown between Mr. Biden and Mr. Trump in November. Back to you, Anradi. All right, thank you very much. That was our the World News Special Correspondent, Suzanne Chanali from Toronto in Canada. Thanks again. Well, let's go in for a short commercial break. Stay tuned as on the other side, we have more updates on some key regional stories. We'll be right back. <laughs> Welcome back. 
We have yet more border disputes in our region of Asia. As China says, the Philippines ignored proposals it put forward to manage their dispute in the South China Sea. The islands in the area are at the center of a territorial dispute between China and varying other countries. China on Tuesday claimed indisputable sovereignty over islands in the South China Sea after the Philippines questioned a proposal from Beijing regarding the handling of disputes in the region. Earlier the same day, the Philippines Foreign Ministry said China's proposals undermined international law and were against national interests. China's Foreign Ministry spokesperson Wang Wenbin argued that China's plans were submitted with sincerity and goodwill, saying the Philippines' regrettable response spoiled the atmosphere of communication and cooperation between the two sides. Tensions between China and the Philippines have been escalating with frequent clashes between coast guards and civilian ships from both countries in the contested, resource-rich South China Sea. Meanwhile, we're seeing more cooperation between key regional players tonight, especially when it comes to future technologies. A trilateral meeting on tech was held between the US, South Korea and India in hopes of reaching consensus and collaboration on advancing the existing technologies at much faster speeds. South Korea, the U.S. and India are strengthening cooperation in critical and emerging technologies. As on Tuesday, the three countries held the first trilateral dialogue on the topic. The third deputy director of national security, Wang Yun-jung, hosted his U.S. counterpart, Tarun Chabra, and India's Lakanta Kar in Seoul to discuss cooperation on pharmaceuticals, semiconductor supply chain, AI, and space, among other things. The top office says, while tech cooperation was largely between Seoul, Washington and Tokyo, New Delhi's inclusion is significant as India is a leader in space technology and has the workforce to support the pharmaceutical supply chain. Such dialogue was agreed to be launched following the South Korea-U.S. Next Generation Critical and Emerging Technologies Dialogue held in Seoul late last year. And an update on the doctor strikes that ail South Korea now. Medical school professors will now decide by Friday whether they will also collectively resign, meaning the Emergency Response Committee of Professors will spend the next few days seeing whether other medical professors are seeking to take such a collective action. The massive walkout by junior doctors could soon spread to a collective resignation of medical professors nationwide. An emergency response committee of professors from 19 medical schools across the country decided in a late night online meeting on Tuesday to determine whether to submit collective resignation letters by Friday. Those schools include the so called Big Five hospitals in Seoul, such as Seoul National University, Yonsei University, and Catholic University. In the statement released after the meeting, the professors said they would protect the trainee doctors from legal actions by the government. Also, they will stop the government's plan to expand the medical school quarter. Meanwhile, Kim tae the chairman of the Emergency Response Committee of the Korean Medical Association, underwent intense police interrogation at the Seoul Metropolitan Police Station for over 14 hours from Tuesday afternoon. Kim is among the five individuals that the Health Ministry on February 27 accused of obstructing junior doctors' training through incitement of their mass walkout. After interrogation, he said the government's strong stance is regrettable and the walkout of trainee doctors is entirely voluntary. The current situation, sparked by the government's plan to increase medical school enrollment by 2,000 places, has been ongoing for four weeks. And now we have some economic updates for you. Official figures show that the UK economy has picked up in January, boosted by stronger sales in shops and online and more construction activity. The economy grew by 0.2% following a fall in output during the previous month. The Office for National Statistics said the services sector led the bounce back after retailers struggled to draw in shoppers in December. Well, to tell you a bit about this, we have other day on news special correspondent Aruni Adhikari from Nottingham in the UK. Aruni. Yes, Sanuradi. This is an early estimate, but signals how the UK which entered recession at the end of 2023 is faring. 
the new figures were in line with what economists were expecting. Some experts said it could suggest the economy may be turning a corner after dipping into recession at the end of last year. Areas of growth were offset by falls in TV and film production, legal services and the pharmaceutical industry, which can be quite volatile. People spending less, doctor strikes and a fall in school attendance dragged the UK into a recession at the end of 2023. Responding to the latest figures, Chancellor Jeremy Hunt said, while the last few years have been tough, today's numbers show they are making progress in growing the economy, part of which makes it possible to bring down national insurance contributions by £900 this coming year. Back to you, Anuradi. All right, thank you very much for the continued updates. That was other than the World News Special Correspondent Arne Adhikari from Nottingham in the UK. Meanwhile, Boeing is burning up at the moment. With the FAA hounding down on the company's lacking standards and security checks, more concern has been add on as a key whistleblower related to Boeing has been found dead. The focus for investigators, that terrifying nosedive off New Zealand that injured dozens. Passengers say the LATAM pilot claimed he suddenly lost control of the Boeing 787 when the flight data computers went dark. In 2016, the FAA issued an airworthiness directive for the 787, warning that if the flight control computers are not reset every 22 days, they could shut themselves down, which could result in flight controls that don't respond and a temporary loss of controllability. Meanwhile, two months since that mid-air MAX 9 emergency, sources close to the investigation say Boeing has failed 33 of 89 FAA audits. The FAA confirming it identified non-compliance issues in Boeing's manufacturing process control, parts handling and storage, and product control. In an email, Boeing's chief of commercial planes today called on every employee to precisely follow every step of our manufacturing procedures and processes. While in South Carolina, a coroner says former Boeing whistleblower John Barnett took his own life before his upcoming trial against the company. In a statement, Boeing says we are saddened by Mr. Barnett's passing and our thoughts are with his family and friends. Let's go for a short commercial break. More world news on the other side. Stay tuned. Welcome back. We're celebrating gentle giants tonight. Around 70 elephants in Thailand's ancient city of Ayutthaya enjoyed a special fruit feast to celebrate National Elephant Day, accompanied by traditional ceremonies performed by Buddhist monks in the country. Local and international volunteers were invited to participate in offering 10 tons of fruits and vegetables to the giant mammals, fostering an understanding of the strong connection between Thais and domesticated elephants. There are about 3,800 domesticated domesticated elephants left in wildlife sanctuaries across Thailand, and this is according to the Thai Wildlife and Plant Conservation Department. Thailand's National Elephant Day was initiated by wildlife conservationists in 1998, serving as a reminder to Thais about the importance of elephants and encouraging support for efforts to safeguard them from poaching. And finally tonight, we've heard of Atlantis. Now get ready for France's Mont Saint-Michel, which truly looked like a location right out of Hogwarts today as it was surrounded by the waters of the English Channel as the tide reached its highest point this year. Visitors could be seen waiting at the end of the exceptionally flooded road leading to the site as the water made crossing possible only by boat. Tourists began flocking to the abbey and the village that arose in the shadows of its walls in the 1980s after it was designated a World Heritage site. The Mont Saint-Michel is one of France's most visited monuments and attracts more than 2 million visitors every year. But talk about a transformation, it looks right out of a Harry Potter book. Well, that's all the stories we have for you tonight. We'll see you again tomorrow with more updates on the happenings of the world. Thanks very much for watching. Have a good night.